Thank you, Joe. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Sam. I'm a software engineer in New York City. I work primarily on um, machine learning and AI applications uh, for a quantitative hedge fund. And my talk is called Demystifying Clearview, uh, where effectively I'm going to give you a demonstration of how, uh, how you would leverage today's existing technologies to implement the same kind of um, detection and recognition uh, uh, like for functionality that Clearview currently has. The, the New York Times was the first uh, outlet to actually publish an article about Clearview, which went into detail uh, as to the amount of information and the, the types of people that have actually been using this application. Um, over the years, a lot of other outlets have come out you know, with more information. And in fact, there have been several hacks of Clearview software to um, that went into detail as far like who they, who was really sharing it. Initially, Clearview said it was primarily law enforcement using it, but then what we come to find out it, is that uh, there are a lot of uh, organizations that were not in law enforcement, and specifically there were individuals, um, primarily like a lot of their backers and clients that were actually using the application for uh, various reasons. Um, so a lot of those outlets have talked about you know, the, the information that Clearview has, which is roughly 3 billion images. They've also talked about the people that have been using Clearview, uh, such as the FBI, IC, Interpol, and actually some, um, some, uh, some like other countries as well, uh, countries with the questionable human rights records. But instead of talking about those things, I actually wanna focus on the technical aspects of Clearview, which specifically boils down to uh, the two methods that they've mentioned or went into detail as far as explaining how they actually went about collecting the data and how they're currently using uh, technology to or how they're currently using AI to detect and um, uh, and uh, kind of categorize people. Uh, they said web scraping, but in reality, what they've been doing is breaking the law and also breaking a lot of the user license and user agreements that uh, a lot of the websites just as Google and Facebook has. The difficulty is that it's very difficult to stop it, um, largely because uh, to to Facebook or to Google, uh, there's no distinction between a bot that's actually saving the image versus a browser that's actually viewing the image. And as far as the artificial as far as the artificial intelligence parts goes, um, there isn't really anything revolutionary to what Clevier is doing. And part of the reason why I'm going through the process of demonstrating this app is primarily to show you that without any kind of new technology, without any kind of um, anything special, uh, I can actually just build something that pulls data from online sources and uh, runs a few libraries on top of it to actually give you very easy tracking and recognition, uh, that, the kind of tracking and recognition that you know 10 years ago you'd only see in movies. So going back to the very, very, uh, I guess, beginnings of uh, facial recognition, the technology itself is extremely old. Uh, it goes back to the 1960s uh, when a gentleman named Roger Wilson Bledsoe was doing a lot of research into what pieces of the face can you actually analyze to be able to distinguish one person from the other. Back in those days, a lot of the work was manual, which meant that the researcher would have to manually tell the computer where the noses were, where the uh, eyes were, and based on the coordinates, the computer would kind of like figure out, uh, this is one person, this is another person. Uh, which the, the major kind of um, technical breakthrough that happened uh, was primarily around 2008. And Google and Facebook, uh, you might not see them as being um, technical breakthroughs, but they very much were in a lot of ways because they made it kind of easy and somewhat fun to do two things that the researchers back in those days were not able to do, which is one, they made it easy for people to submit their information to a centralized place. And second, uh, they made it easy for that information to be organized. In a lot of ways, Facebook and Google uh, were different companies, but together they enabled a lot of the technology that we currently have today, because um, without all these images from Facebook and without all this indexing from Google, it would be a lot harder to actually train a model right now in terms of identifying not just people, but also objects. So for a bit of context as to uh, the, the size of the data set that Clearview has collected, uh, the FBI has been collecting facial recognition data since 1992. Um, they were first 
required by Congress to report how much information they had, who they who they had the information on. Um, and back in those days, they only had the, the only the only database that they had was primarily from like booking photos and mugshots of criminals and other uh, other other people that actually had a record. And for a long time, they didn't report to Congress anymore as to what they were doing with that technology. And it, we didn't really find out up until 2008 that their database had grown to, grown to roughly 400 million more people in pictures. And the reason that it grew that size is primarily because a lot of state agencies um, were sharing, uh, state agencies and also federal agencies were sharing pictures such as license uh, license photos, passport photos uh, with the FBI. And effectively, FBI was using technology and using the technology uh, and sharing the technology with them to, 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 to give them like a lot more insights into the, the US population. The problem with that, the problem with the, the reality in 1992 and the reality in 2008 is that whereas 1992 the database was primarily of people that actually had a criminal record that had a reason to to actually be within the FBI database by 2008 the majority of the people that were actually within that database were people that didn't have a record at all um, and so that was very concerning to Congress and I believe uh, at that point the FBI started getting like a lot more oversight into what they were doing and um, and and whose data that they had and I think beginning in 2008 they got a, like a lot of pushback. Um, a lot of congressmen were actually trying to put legislation in to make it such that they don't use those kind of technologies. And for, for the most part, uh, the FBI's capabilities as far as special recognition goes, effectively started to stagnate around that time, up until the September 11th, in which case um, uh, we haven't really heard much about it. But nonetheless, uh, that's kind of, I'd say, become irrelevant. But within the context of Clearview, uh, in just you know, a couple of years because Clivy started back in 2018 or so. Within a couple of years, Clivy has obviously surpassed uh, what it took the FBI roughly 10 years to do. And what's the reason for that? There's a very specific reason for that, primarily because the technology that they're using somewhat mandates having that large of a data set. And whereas historic, like whereas in the past, to have 300 billion images to sort through uh, would be an impossible task to find one person. But because of the way that technology actually works, it makes it such that you have to have that many images to, to be able to effectively track and identify people. So like I mentioned, I'm going to actually go through the development process with you guys as far as collecting data, processing data and analyzing it and putting it in a way such that you can actually you know, carry out whatever application that you're trying to carry out. But um, I'm going to give you a broad overview of what the process would be if we we're actually to go end to end as far as productionizing it. But today, what I'm going to focus on is like the first four steps, primarily showing you how the data collection process would happen, um, the kind of things you would do here and there to clean the data, uh, fill the gaps in. And then secondly, I'll talk about the actual machine learning models that you would build to either do classification or to do kind of um, uh, categorizing one or categorizing one object from a different object. And lastly, I'll kind of give you a, a broad idea as to how you can actually take the the deep learning technology or deep learning methods and then combine that with, just broadly speaking, just big regular product development, software engineering to actually get one type, like a certain specific type of capability out of it. Um, like for me, the the process of actually getting CTCV data is, was very transparent and straightforward because the Department of Transportation actually has a website where it lists all the webcams that are currently running live on all traffic that goes within Manhattan um, as well as Brooklyn. I know for a fact that San Francisco has one, but I'm not quite sure about like a lot of other major cities. But the, the gist of it is that this, this information is public and anyone um, it's, a, it's available to anyone who actually wants to get to it. And whereas the DOT has a fairly uh, fairly open API for a lot of the information that I'm trying to get, for Clearview, the equivalent would pretty much just be going to a site like Twitter, um, looking into the source code or just watching the network traffic and pulling in all the images that gets fed in through the browser. As far as... Um, Twitter's like end user license agreement goes, they're not supposed to be doing this. But as I've just shown you, uh, Twitter doesn't have a, a very easy way of distinguishing a person that's legitimately going through their site um, versus a robot that's going, don't going through their site and scraping their pictures. So the hardest part for me anyways, ended up being 
um, or at least it was kind of fun, but, uh, but the, the, the nuts and bolts parts as far as pulling in the data was really having to do with um, figuring out how many cameras that I wanted to tap into. And once I had that, um, like the, broadly speaking, the cameras that I wanted to target on, it's a matter of like basically setting up processes such that as the cameras are recording, I'm actually able to record that data and put it somewhere where I can actually access it later. Um, it's easier said than done primarily because I, my, I only have one laptop. And so uh, I have to use a laptop for other things. And all these, all this processing is very, very, very um, um, like CPU intensive. And so the solution to that is actually using a, um, a, a service like AWS. And so what I ended up doing is actually well, I created an AWS account, and fortunately, they give you 750 hours for free as far as uh, compute power goes. And so once I had roughly a cluster of eight computers, I spun up each computer such that it would record a camera feed. And through over the course of uh, 72 hours, it would just effectively record every second that was coming back from the CCTV camera and saves it locally such that I can process it later. And what you're seeing here is pretty much uh, four compute instances at Amazon that's taking in data from uh, the CCTV feeds and just either saving it or processing it on those uh, on those specific machines. And ultimately, what you end up with is a real-time feed, or well, not real-time feed, but it's effectively what you would normally, what you end up with is like a local recording of the CCTV uh, cameras that you would otherwise have to go through the uh, the, the Department of Transportation Web Webcam website to, to, to analyze. Running the machine learning models on top of it gives you what you're seeing here, which is one, you have the original feed on the left side and the right side, you have all these kind of like objects that are being tracked um, on the uh, on the frames. The depending on a model that you're that you're running, you can actually track a lot more than just cars. Some models track people, they track um, bicycles, they track motorcycles and buses. But for 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 our methods, I'm only tracking cars because one, uh, it takes a lot less comp compute power, and secondly, as you track each object, the the library also pulls out and ext extract the objects into individual um, um, individual kind of uh, the, the, the detections. And the reason for that is, you know, obviously, you have different things that you could apply this kind of technology to, right? So one application is um, like speed limits within school zones. We already have traffic cameras so that does this. Another application that's a lot more specific to this kind of technology is something like Amber Alert. And the reason is because, as I mentioned, when the uh, machine learning model pulls out each of the individual each, each of the indiv individual cars that are scanned in from um, like these snapshots, it is able to like order the cars within uh, within a classification that that says that this car is closer to another car may that be because of color because of make or because of model and based on that information you can specifically pick for example i'm looking for a red acura and simply by giving it that search term or giving it like a, what a red acura would look like it can tell you from all the different traffic cameras uh, throughout the city where such a car has been spotted and so this is great for if you have uh, any police officers within the area, you can tell them, hey, watch out for this car uh, within, you know, third and 23rd. Uh, so uh, that's a very simple application that I'm not quite sure if uh, it's currently in use, but it's certainly one of those things that can actually be implemented fairly easy right now with this kind of technology. And, you know, just to mention in terms of uh, the development of this, it took me roughly three days to collect the data and one day to uh, pre-process it and another day to actually run the machine learning on top of it. So this is just me doing this on my laptop and also with a few AWS um, computers. So you can imagine uh, Clearview with several million dollars uh, of backing and also the Department of Transportation with their ex existing feed into this data, not even having to do the pre-processing that I'm having to do. Uh, they can certainly do this kind of stuff in real time. So um, you have you have five minutes. Oh wow. Uh, okay, great. So I guess real quickly. So there's a te there's a detection part. There's also the search part. Um, the detection itself is fairly easy. 
and the the thing that concerns a lot of people is really Cleary's ability to search throughout different images and match match up one person from another. The reality is they don't actually uh, do recognition as much as they do um, image searching. And from 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 screenshot of Tick News, uh, Screen News app, what they've basically done is uh, implemented. Google's image search, but the difference between image search and what they have is obviously the fact that they have several, they have a lot, a lot more pictures of people that they're able to match up together. Um, and so the, the danger of this is a lot of people are not aware that these pictures uh, within Clearview's database, and oftentimes they're not, they're not publicly available pictures per se. For example, if a law enforcement officer was actually using Clearview, um, you know, without being sanctioned by his department, uploads a picture of your uh, driver's license, all of a sudden, uh, Clivia now has that picture, um, which it shouldn't be having in the first place. Uh, and it, it also makes it easier for other people to kind of like, if they were to hack Clivia, not only are, are they able to get Clivia's source code, uh, Clivia's um, client list, but they can also now have your picture, um, which Clivia like just made it a lot easier for everybody to get. So in terms of how you can defend yourself against such a technology, there's been a couple of different ways that's come up, uh, that's come up that's come up over the over the years. One of the primary ways was primarily using um, um, uh, strobes to interfere with the camera's ability, or infrared strobes anyways, to interfere with the camera's ability to effectively get the pixels back to match up one person with another. But another, um, for, for, for Clearview's case, which is where they're actually taking pictures that they're not supposed to and uploading into the database, the, the primary way that you're actually going to defend yourself against such a, such a thing is actually by modifying your pictures to begin with. You can think of it as being a filter that to a human being is actually um, not noticeable, but to a deep learning model, because of the way that the model is uh, implemented, uh, it's, it, it's able to trick them into believing one thing is another. Or rather, it's able to it's able to confuse them as to what exactly they're looking at because deep learning models are actually looking at every pixel of the picture. They're not looking at uh, the high level uh, abstraction that the picture is trying to uh, demonstrate. And so the, the gist of this is that like a lot of this, this technology is not new and uh, the defenses for it, like uh, they, they're there, but they're an inconvenience to you and I, as far as, the, the reason why Clearview has kind of been so brazen with uh, what they're doing is because they're, they're using the argument that it's legal. But the reality is when you look at laws such as CCPA, which nowadays mandates that companies have to tell you what they're doing with your data, and specifically you have the right of asking them to delete your data, it's very easy for you to go to Clearview and say, like, delete all my pictures. The problem is, as I've shown you a few steps back is, there's a lot of information that's generated by this, uh, by these machine learning models. For example, these pictures, as you're seeing them right now, they're just a regular, you know, RGB representation. But there's also intermediate representations that you and I can't see because they are not in 2D or 3D space, but rather in like multi-dimensional space. And those pictures are saved on Clearview servers and Cluvi uses those pictures to train their models. And so in reality, they might, you know, say they've deleted all your pictures, but they're still using representations of you, representations of your, of your face to train the models and optimize the models. So to the extent that the law believes that th that kind of like derivative data is your data, um, Cluvi still has the ability to uh, kind of use your information against you. And up until people recognize the, 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 the the process that uh, Clearview uses and technology that they use, in fact, to 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 do these things, it's going to be um, very easy for them to kind of like circumvent the law because it you can't make a prima facie case that Clearview actually has your information um, just based on what we know about them and just not even based on the fact that they're able to uh, to match up your face because when you train a model, you do away with all the training data and ultimately. Um, you can actually have a new set of data. Well, the, the whole, the gist of deep learning is that the application is able to predict or um, understand things that it has not seen before. So once the model is trained and you've saved the model weights and you save the model state and are now using it with the, like a completely brand new picture, um, you're not aware of the fact that within the model state, all these other pictures that belong to you are actually still there. So legally speaking if you know if you have a um, a judge that's able to agree with you and a lawyer that's able to um, um articulate this if clearview if you have a right to for your data to be deleted 
it means that Clearview you would have to retrain the models without your data to make it such that they're actually not using the data anymore. Um, and that's prohibitively expensive because as I showed you before, when I had to set up a cluster of Amazon AWS servers to actually train this model, because of the fact that Clearview is training on 3 billion, 3 billion pictures as opposed to several hundred pictures, as several hundred thousand pictures I'm, as I'm doing, it becomes prohibitively, prohibitively expensive to start training models with pictures that you don't have the right to. So, um, but again, that's an argument that's going to have to be made, uh, and that's an argument that enough people are going to going to have, going to have to understand before they can actually start exercising those rights. There are people that are currently doing, you know, regular CCPA requests, such as give me all the pictures that you have on me, delete all the pictures that you have on me. But as far as asking Clearview to retrain the models without your pictures, that's something that I've not seen anyone go as far as doing. And I think that's really where um, you're going to have uh, the costs associated with this technology that's going to make companies like Clearview um, a lot less, a lot more reluctant to actually do this stuff. Um, Thanks, John, so you need to close yeah. up very quickly, if that's okay. So go for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Are you done? Yep. Do you want to close it up with any final comments? Um, yeah, the, the source code for this, uh, this is this is actually a Jupyter notebook where I was going to demonstrate the, um, um, the distance metric that you can actually use to analyze one picture versus another. Because when you convert a picture from, you know, pixels uh, into something that a machine learning model can can understand, it pretty much converts that into a multi multi dimensional vector, and it's just a matter of figuring out like which vector is closest to another vector, which is a very simple mathematical operation. And you can do this for um, any kind of picture. Uh, it's just a matter of like processing it correctly, such that the pictures are the right size and the, the right uh, color, and um, what else? The source code itself, I can certainly like show you if you're interested in looking at it. Um, I, because of the fact that I had to deploy this in AWS, I ended up using uh, Node.js for a lot of the processing, um, and then for the actual machine learning model um, in terms of uh, object detection and object classification, I used a library called Image AI, which is actually a high-level wrapper for uh, the TensorFlow and Keras libraries, um, which made it very, very easy to actually just process a lot of this information. Um, there are also a few other utilities that I use, primarily FMPEG, which is an open source um, like encoding uh, encoding application that makes it such that you can actually slice images um, and uh, kind of format them into different encodings. Uh, that was, yeah, I can, I can share more details about that if you have questions, um, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much the gist of it. Yeah. Okay, um, Sam, thank you very much for um, fitting us in in this unusual session uh, at CSB Comp. I, as just to reiterate what we're going to do, so we're going to share this in the general channel in Slack and um, give people the opportunity to watch this in their own time. And then sure. if you're available tomorrow to, to maybe continue some of these conversations on Slack, um, you can do that by text or we've got a... Uh, core cool functionality in Slack. So it, it may be you want to organize yourself a session where you can talk through some of these issues in a bit more. But that was sure. really, it was really fantastic. And I'm really pleased we managed to fit this in because. Yeah, me too. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, 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 this is primarily to supposed to be like a discussion piece because the, the, the technical stuff is, is, uh, it's very deep, but um, it's just one of those things that I, I've noticed that a lot of people haven't really talked about, despite the fact that that's really where you're going to have uh, the ability to make any changes. Uh, may that be changes in the law or changes in Clearview's behavior. So I, I just wanted to go into a bit more detail about that and also kind of share the, um, the how easy this actually do.